Welcome to this brand new episode of the Marketing Technology Podcast. This podcast is hosted by Mark van Horek and myself, Elias Krum. We're both from Marketing Guys in the Netherlands. Welcome, Steve Wiedemann on the Marketing Technology Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me this morning. I'm excited to talk tech and, and uh, really get into SEO. We, we love to have you on the show. He said this morning, good morning. So you're not in Europe. Where are you, Steve? <laughs> I'm over here in Southern California uh, dealing with these fires that are happening. The oh, yeah. nearest was about three miles away. So fortunately, they were able to, to put it out. But it's, it's definitely unhealthy weather out here right now. Well, they saved uh, the Reagan National Library uh, yesterday, didn't they? I believe so. Yeah, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been touch and go. I've got a lot of uh, friends that have left their homes just uh, out of safety. And then they would report back that the fires are out and their homes are okay. So our firefighters are, are doing their job well. Yeah, well, it's different here. <laughs> it's, it's more like fall and it's going to rain again. So yeah, it's rainy, and, uh, but we don't have those wildfires. To me, it seems like every time I fly to the U.S., you know, some, something is going on. And uh, sometimes it's, it seems like more like a third world country. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Once I flew into Chicago, we had like, it was completely flooded. And then I flew mm. into LA, it was all kind of fires. And there was snowstorms or tornadoes going on. It's like, mm-hmm. well, you have, you have something to talk about every time. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's true. Keep, so, it keeps you on your toes. Steve, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you're doing? Sure, sure. Uh, so I, uh, right out of high school, I, I joined uh, our military over here and did the, the basic tour. And uh, while I was there, they enlisted me to help with something called Task Force 21, working with laptops and helping soldiers, you know, be able to, to do some pretty creative things with laptops and, uh, and weaponry. And um, I just kind of developed a, a passion for, you know, all things IT and computers. And when I got out of the military, I, I discovered a, a love for the internet and started designing websites, but I couldn't sustain a, a good recurring income with it because those clients just weren't getting any business from it. They throw their website on their card and um, they're like, hey, this is really nice, but I can't imagine why I would need you now that it's done. And so, you know, I had to I had to make my myself a little bit more marketable, and I learned about digital marketing, uh, everything from uh, you know driving referral traffic, and uh, eventually something we called search engine optimization, which at the time was just website promotion or internet marketing. Um, when was that? As, this was back in the late '90s, like '99, and I know I'm old. <laughs> uh, online dinosaur. <laughs> I am. Hey, hey, and hey, it's hey, true. Yeah. And so, so I just. I really enjoyed it. And, you know, I started documenting everything that I was learning and I, I organized them into information products more for myself as kind of a cheat sheet for how I want to, you know, organize my task list of what I do for, you know, all those different disciplines of search, like tech and content and outreach and link building and so forth. And, um, a lot of my, my peers really, you know, liked, um, you know, what I put together. So I made them a little more formal and started selling them online and, Started to make a little bit of a, a name for myself back in the 2000s as, as SEO Steve, right? Um, <laughs> I picked up uh, some pretty fun jobs with companies like Disney. I was the SEM account manager for Disneyland um, here in Southern California, uh, as well as Adventures by Disney, which is an international travel site. Um, so I, I, I got my feet wet in the corporate world doing paid and organic search and um, uh, eventually got a degree in e-business management, learning everything from you know, computer networking, database administration, uh, web design, graphics, you know, the, the whole uh, array of different things that go into e-business. And my, my career for the last 20 years has been centered around the internet, digital marketing, and, you know, uh, you know continuing to follow my passion for, uh, in particular, organic search. And Steve, you, you've got actually, you've got an IT background mm-hmm. as we start. Do you think that it's been an advantage that you had the IT and the technology as uh, the starting point instead of being like a marketeer, a traditional marketeer, and then going into internet marketing? A hundred percent. There, there isn't a day that goes by that someone on the team who focuses on content strategy or on outreach will come back to me and say, 
hey, something's broken or something's not working or we just got an email from the web server and I don't know what to do about it because I do content and I do whatever. So having that, that IT background gives me a little bit of an advantage to you know, at least understand the, the foundation of some of the, the components that go into you know, a healthy website. So I think, um, I think that helped. In college, I took all my notes in HTML kind of crazy, right? But I, I really wanted to make sure that I mastered it. And so um, I literally just had notepad open and would code HTML, title, end title, uh, uh, you know, body, the whole thing. And I'd do my notes like that every day so that the other students, you know, would have access to it. And then I would be able to um, just to really master it. Now, on, on any given occasion, I can look at the source code of a page and help troubleshoot, um, you know, and, and I can teach students now. I'm, I'm teaching at two different uh, colleges and and helping students learn just twenty or so basic HTML tags, uh, so that they they at least know where to troubleshoot and look for metadata and headings and subheadings and knowing the difference between attributes and variables and why they're important toward ADA compliance and other things. You know all of all of um, you know what I learned in IT uh, at some point or another came in handy in you know in, in my career in SEO. Well, well, we both come a long way because I also, uh, in the end of the 90s, I think in 1996, I made the first website in basic HTML. Um, <laughs> front page? <laughs> even before that, that, even before yeah. front page and Dreamweaver. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but anyhow, SEO has evolved enormously in, since, mm -hmm. uh, since the millennial. Uh, um, can you tell a little bit more how that, evolved and sure, what yeah. are the most important things to have what was the most important things for seo in mm -hmm. 2019 sure so you're right seo has, has evolved and it's going to continue to evolve um it's it's actually part of of the the joy we have as seos is following the the trends and the changes and, and adapting you know, they used to say a judge of a, you know, a man's character is based on, you know, where he ends up in life. And today, you know, judge of a man's character and, and what we're learning is your ability to adapt since there's so much change. And SEO is a perfect example of that. Um, historically, before, say, 2010, the, the SEO world was a wild, wild west of anything that we could do to manipulate rankings because there weren't any guidelines or, um, you know, link schemes documents or anything that would... Uh, tell us what Google did or didn't want us to do. Um, once they started putting some rules in place and, and making some updates and creating some spam filters, yeah, you know the 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 mode of operation had to change toward a mentality of do you know do ordinary things you know extraordinarily well as opposed to taking shortcuts and and you know finding cheat ways to to manipulate rankings and and in doing that it's it's made SEO so much easier we we focus on three areas right we focus on you know continuing to make sure that our page is the most relevant and helpful continuing to make sure our page you know is is the most visible on the internet through curation and um you know our our short answers being shared and um you know links of course which are still you know really the foundation of Google's ranking algorithm still um and then really ignoring some of the the skeptics around user behavior signals you know as, as you know google keeps saying you know ranking is all about content and links content and links but the reality is when you watch your search console and you look at your your result when it's on page one it all revolves around user behaviors are they clicking on you the most and are they staying on your website you know and, and how do you get them to click on you more well gee maybe we could put some some extra code on the page to, to create these really rich snippets that show up so that we stand out. You know, maybe there's some things that we can do to make our listing more helpful and, and more clickable. Um, so those, those foundation things aren't going to change. You always, you always have to be the most relevant. Uh, you always have to continue to be the most visible uh, and you always have to be the one that users choose in the search results and stay. Um, and you have to, work on the pattern of improving all three of those. And that's, again, that's, that's just core to SEO. Where we need to start evolving beyond that, if you're already doing that, really, is something that, you know, that we've, we've, kind of, um, uh, we've kind of coined as vroom, like a really fast car. And that's voice readiness, mobile, markup, and measurement. Those are the areas of focus, really, for the, you know, the rest of the quarter here in 2019 and into next year voice readiness and, and making sure that you're, you're swapping out your magnifying glass 
search icon on mobile with a microphone so that people can use the Google Voice API, you know, and, and talk in their queries if they're driving or if, you know, they, they can't be somewhere to use their keyboard. Uh, voice in making sure that all of your, your uh, upper funnel content has a short answer right there at the top that other people can share and curate so that you get that feature and answer spot and appear on voice answers on Google Home and Nest now, as they're calling it, and, um, and Alexa and so forth. Uh, and voice readiness and claiming your business with the actual Google Assistant and, you know, just, just doing some very basic things like answering questions about your hours and location and, and history and common questions that customer service reps have should be, you know, the first questions that you put on when you start manually entering those, those questions and, and answer options. So there's voice readiness. On the mobile side of things, as you know, it's like 65, 70% mobile now. Our restaurant franchises we work with are 80% mobile devices now, at least here in the States, 80%. So to not be thinking about mobile is, is really ignorant. Uh, because it's it's super important to focus on users that are on mobile devices and and having the mindset of one day my user isn't even going to be touching a device. They're going to be untethered from the device and I need to still be able to serve my result and sell my product to them, you know, as they start to untether themselves and start looking up from their phones and using more technologies that are, you know, that that are uh, hands free. So I think I think that's going to be a really important piece of it. And mobile, as you know, has to do with, with page speed. It has to do with mobile usability and, and tap targets. And, and again, uh, you know, creating a, a touch-free environment. On the, you know, the markup side of things, you know, there's this whole schema.org that's been around now. It seems like, feels like 10 years, but it's probably more like six. And you know, schema is great because it, it allows you to tell the, the search engines you know, a little more information about all the content, as, as you know. Um, you can, and, and they've got all sorts of new ones that come out. It seems like with every big update they do, they, they come out with an email that says, Hey, now you can do these great, you know, which snip, which snippets for podcasts and for news and recipes. And now we've got recipe cards at the top. There's so many cool things that you could do. One of our, our, uh, our clients is doing a promotion right now related to Adam's family. And if you search for any of their locations right underneath their listing, there's a, a date and a link to that Adam's family breakfast promotion. So that it gives you extra real estate in the search results, gives the user a little more information and drives them to the content that's most important to them. So they don't have to click the page and click a banner to get to the page. They see that short link right in the search results. So, so thinking about you know, all the different ways that we can mark up our content, our, our images, our videos, you know, our, uh, what type is this? Is it a blog? Is there, is there a question and answer that we could put on here to get some questions beneath our result? There's so many neat things that we can do that will affect what users see in search results and ultimately affect that user behavior signal that uh, over time helps to, to really garner those rankings that you want. The last part's measurement. And this is something that, that's been super challenging for a lot of businesses, particularly on the attribution side. Some businesses have it figured out. You hit their site and, and you're going to go through a series of different remarketing uh, campaigns. You're going to see different creative based on, on different things that you've already seen and actions you've already taken. Um, those marketers really have their, their marketing automation and, you know, their, their holistic attribution models dialed in, but most businesses don't probably 90% of businesses haven't really figured out attribution and audiences and, um, and what to do when a user gets to the website, uh, in a way to pull them back in either from, you know, some level of remarketing on, on a social network or on search. Um, and then the, the, uh, online to offline uh, tracking that online to offline is still a huge challenge. And when you're working with franchises and you've, you've got, you know, 2000 or 4,000 restaurants or several thousand, you know, storage locations trying to track when somebody types in a keyword to when they come into the store and actually make a purchase can be really challenging. And Google's given some ways to do that on the paid side of things, but on organic, you know, it, it does take a, a lot of effort and barcoding and, and some other things that make it a little more challenging. So you know, we've, we've been working with a company called measure school and, you know, they've, they've really helped to help us understand, um, overall, um, you know, what, what kind of strategy do we need to have in place to do a good job of tracking through Google tag manager and Google analytics and Google ads and making sure there's no duplicate, you know, conversions and events happening, understanding what people are, are scrolling and clicking on and, 
um, you know, that's, that's a real challenge to a lot of marketing staff. So I think that's, that's the, to me, if you've got relevancy, popularity and user behavior down and you're just, you're just dominating, like, what do I do next? Well, voice readiness, you know, mobile optimization, markup and measurement, I think is, is really got to be the priority for the next year or two. Wow. So, um, that's some, some really cool, cool tips. And also, also about the tools, um, the companies that you work for in a restaurant business, for example, um, before they start investing in SEO, they probably ask you, what's this, what's this going to bring me? So what's, mm-hmm. how much do I invest? How do I measure return? Um, so how do you, would you answer that question to your uh, customers or to our listeners? So how do we measure results from SEO? Sure, sure. So you do have to do some conservative forecasting. Once you've got a baseline of, you know, where the client ranks for the keywords that, that you know are going to be important to them, you know, after you've done a, a full keyword research effort and you've, you've kind of built out a suggested taxonomy and you've, you've listed out which keywords are going to be the most important and segmented the, the ones that are uh, persuasive sales type keywords, you know, based on the intent versus upper funnel, more awareness. And you know the conversion rate between the two when you look at their data so that you can draw some estimates then as long as you can understand the, the click-through curve in, in search results, you can draw some conservative estimates of, of how much traffic you're going to drive from each set of those search terms and you know, what, a, uh, what the conservative estimate would be over the next 6 to 12 months if you were to able to help, uh, help them move into the top 3 to 5 search results. And Basically, again, I, yeah, I always recommend being conservative. Okay, so being conservative about it, but uh, being uh, promising or let's say stating that someone could be in the three to five uh, position is is quite promising, I would guess. So it's, it's challenging, bold. bold. So, um, <laughs> and that's what, what a lot of listeners also ask us. Uh, it's like, sure. what, what can we expect from SEO? Because, you know, a lot of listeners will say, yeah, I want to be on top of, mm-hmm. uh, of Google. You know, I sure. want to be on the pay- first page on the uh, some somewhere above the fold, um, mm-hmm. if they even know what the fold is, of course. But you know, it's like yeah. I want to be somewhere in top of Google, um, and uh, well, basically uh, promising them that they will be on the third to fifth position is quite something on popular mm-hmm. keywords, right? So, how do you yeah. uh, go around with that? Sure. Well, you know, I guess I guess we're a little bit different because we've been doing it for twenty years and. You know, we, we're not afraid of, we don't, we don't use the column that says uh, competitiveness because we, you know, we, we've learned how to build an information architecture and supportive content and visibility. Um, uh, again, doing ordinary things extraordinarily well, but for a lot of smaller businesses or newer SEOs or those folks that haven't had to compete against, you know, a, you know, an Amazon or an eBay for super broad competitive keywords, mm-hmm. you know, the, the right way to, to really set expectations is to say in year one, we're going to address all of the specific queries that users make um, where it's extremely specific to your product and not broad. So if you sell iPad cases um, and you've got some that have blue flowers on them and others that have R2D2, then we're going to target, um, you know, iPad covers or iPhone covers and, um, with R2, D2 or, or blue flowers, uh, for sale, right? We'll yeah. use a longer tail query to be, you know, very specific. And then we'll use a call to action where we say lowest price guaranteed or something that, that gives them the confidence that, that they, um, don't need to go back and go to Amazon, uh, once they find the product. I think starting that way, we had a client that, um, that started with us in 2010 and he said, you know, I'd really like to, I'd really like to rank for Rolex watches and for all of the <laughs> models for Rolex watches. And then we said, why don't we start with used and men's and we'll do that across every product category. And, you know, within each product description, we'll be as, as descriptive as we can, um, you know, and, and try to be as helpful as we can within the first year. Um, you know, it generated about 130,000 in, in online sales, you know, which isn't bad for a first year considering oh. how long it takes to build a website and write all that content and, you know, and, and to really fine tune all the UX. Um, and then the, you know, the next couple of years after he you know, kind of earned some trust with those pages, we started pulling out the word used and men's, you know, since most Rolexes are, are men anyway, there's a ladies category. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now he's on the first page for, you know, every single Rolex model. Um, and, uh, 
you know, but it, it does take a lot of nurturing and tweaking and A-B testing and fine tuning and running surveys and, you know, um, you know, maybe even crowdsourcing and saying, you know, which page do you like better and why? And the user doesn't know which one's the number one listing and which one's you uh, so that you can get that user feedback in, um, you know, in bulk uh, and then run some pivot tables and see what the common themes are and continue to make adjustments. So I would say set the expectation that it's going to be about a year, you know, to, to start seeing some real good traffic from specific keywords that are about you. And then in years two and three, we're going to start, you know, really pushing toward those broader search terms, but we're not going to design that way. When we start, we're going to design with that short tail in mind and we're going to have our primary category. We have a client that performs really well for a truck accident lawyer. And, you know, he's generally in the top three results here in the States. It took about a year to get him there. And it took about 80 pages of supportive content to make that happen. And, you know, it's the expectation was, you know, we're going to start to rank for 18 wheeler truck accident lawyer and big rig truck accident lawyer and cement truck accident lawyer, all of those different more specific search terms, but they're going to be nested underneath a truck accident lawyer page that probably isn't going to rank for a year or two. And we're lucky we actually made it right within that year, just before the end of the year. And he closed some 30 million in cases uh, last the last quarter of 2018 it was his best quarter for truck cases, but it took a year to do it and a lot of supportive content, a lot of rich media and video and, and custom imagery. Um, you know, a lot of fine tuning with, uh, you know, how we, how we design and lay out the page and just continuous fixes on mobile. Um, but yeah, so that's, to me, that's what you do as an SEO is you set an expectation that we're going to, we're going to build the site with the long, with the short tail in mind but we're going to put our, our emphasis and our expectation on the long tail. Uh, and then over you know, years two and three, we'll start drilling into those more competitive keywords. Wow. So yeah, it's a bit like a, a pyramid exp- uh, approach. You, uh, you, you, the, the end of the goal is of the, the, the short tail, but you start by setting it very broad in a, in a long tail and then, Getting there, your foot uh, on on the ground, and then gradually building it up. It also okay. seems that you, for SEO, you have to be quite creative and patient. Mm-hmm. It's a yeah, long term investment. Well. That's yeah, what you're is. saying as well. So the the thing I, I I really like about what you're saying is that that yeah, it's it's going to take you a year and year two and three. We're going to uh, even make this SEO. Uh, uh, let's say the results even better, more, more tailor made, etc. But um, what a lot of people that are not familiar with SEO practices uh, start with is usually to think, yeah, yeah let's, let's invest in SEO because SEO is free. Yeah. And uh, uh, SEA is like uh, uh, we have to pay for ads because SEO is free. And um, <clears throat> the thing I, what, what, what you're explaining here very clearly is that SEO takes time, whether you outsource it to someone like you or you do it yourself or whatsoever, but it's going to take you some, a lot of time but it's mm-hmm. worth the investment because it's a long ter- long-term investment. And that's yeah. what I like about it. And um, I, I do want to come back to the, the measurement a little because you mentioned the tool that you're using. Can you uh, recommend some SEO tools to our listeners that, that sure. you think are good? Because you've been in the business for 20 years, so you, you're able to set, tell some vendors probably, I was in SEO before you even were born, yeah. you know, that, that, that kind of stuff. But yeah. is there any SEO tooling that you would really recommend to our listeners? Absolutely. So if, if you're working with enterprise brands, you know, our, our favorite tools include, um, you know, Conductor, Search Metric, uh, Search Metrics, Bright Edge, uh, Clarity SEO. Those are really good enterprise level platforms for managing your holistic campaign. Help They help with uh, tech and uh, workflow and task management, as well as have some incredible insights in terms of what competitors are doing and how their content's performing and how your content segments are doing. If you are dealing with more you know, smaller businesses or SMBs, um, some of our favorite tools include SEMrush, oh, yeah. uh, who also has an enterprise version of their platform that, that we've been exploring. Um, SEMrush is great because it, it covers the, the gamut of, of you know, links and um, keywords and does have its own crawler and some other tech metrics that are helpful. Um, but they, they still haven't, they still haven't matched what some of the industry crawl tools have yet. You know, they've got a little bit of, of everything, 
but everything that they have isn't the best of, uh, of that particular feature. So uh, from a crawl perspective, right now we're using a service called Write, R-Y-T-E, which is similar to deep crawl or, um, or on crawl or um, what's another kind of enterprise one that's out there, deep crawl, on crawl, um, write. I think those are the big ones. There, there's some clientware that you could install that, that does an okay job if, if the site doesn't have millions of URLs. Otherwise, you'll, you'll run out of RAM, um, such as Screaming Frog, SEO Spider Screaming Frog. And then there's a new one called Site Bulb, S-I-T-E-B-U-L-B. That's really interesting. That's similar to Screaming Frog um, in many ways. Those are some, some great tools. So, you know, that the Google tools are still my favorite. You know, their um, mobile friendliness tool and page speed tools are great um, you know, they've, they've got, um, got all sorts of neat things that you can use within Search Console to test and, and look at things. Hey, how come my pages aren't getting indexed? Oh, you chose a different, um, a different URL than what my canonical is because this page is too similar to my other pages. I guess I better put some time into content development because it seems like a lot of my pages aren't getting indexed. You can see that in Search Console. So Search Console is probably, you know, the, the one place I would look, uh, explore, and, and scrutinize every day. Um, Bing Webmaster Tools also has some really good tools as well. Um, and Bing has more transparency with webmasters. So they'll give you more, more insights and information both in their ads platform and in Search Console, which does bring me to another, I don't know if I'd call it a tool, but um, uh, another opportunity that a lot of, of digital marketers uh, take for granted is that you know with, with each new page that you're creating for SEO, you're also creating a landing page for a specific ad group in your paid search. And with each, you know, specific ad group that you have with the specific landing pages uh, and, and specific keywords, you're going to get better quality scores. Um, you're going to see lower cost per clicks and you're going to collect a lot of data. So one of my, my favorite, um, I don't know if I want to call it a technique, but one of my favorite monthly routines includes going to search console, pulling a specific URL to look at the last several months of data um, fanning through to, to delete anything that's completely irrelevant to that page and then putting those search terms in exact match into the ad group that corresponds with that URL. Um, every time I do that, nine, 10 quality scores out the gate. Um, and likewise, looking at the, you know, the ad, Google ad side of things, I still keep wanting to say AdWords, the Google ad side of things, um, the search term report, it's fantastic. You go to that search term report and see what's converting and re-optimize the page with emphasis on converting search terms, not just on which ones have the highest volumes, but which ones actually drive the most sales or leads, um, you know, and applying some of those search terms to your copy. Um, one, it, it increases the quality score of, of your keywords to begin with. And then two, you start to absorb more organic traffic to that page. And the last part that I really like to, to get from, you know, um, from the, the ads platform is the placements report. Placement report's amazing. Where, where are ads displayed? Not, not for remarketing, because remarketing doesn't really matter where they are. You're still following them because of their original click. Uh, but when someone's on a specific site and you're running a display ad uh, based on the, the placement, not based on the user's audience type, um, you get a lot of really good ideas for links on pages that send conversions your way and maybe even to do some native advertising and reach out and say, Hey, I see you have a Google ad on this page that's sending us some really qualified traffic. We'd love to talk to you about doing something more exclusive, you know, and then you, you purchase advertising from them and maybe down the road, you um, build a good relationship with them and get that organic link from a site that's sending you good qualified traffic. So I think that's probably one of the better tools, if anything to use is leveraging search console and ads to marry your paid and organic search to improve quality score and to improve the array of keywords you rank for organically. Uh, but beyond that, like I mentioned, right, uh, SEM rush, we still use Ahrefs to run intersecting link reports. You know, where, where do all the, the competitors in my industry get their links? I can, I can pull them all into Ahrefs, download that, uh, report for each of them, aggregate it, run a pivot table and say, wow, of the 100 uh, lawyer websites, it looks like 90 of them all have a link from lawyers.com. That might be an important place for us to get visibility and be closer to the center of the semantic web in my, my category, right? So there's some, some great data that you can, you can get from that. You could also use the um, top uh, page by links uh, reports in Ahref and see which page on a competitor's site is is driving the most links to their site and try to come up with something a little bit better. Maybe even kind of conquest them a bit and go back after those people who are linking to them and say, I know you were linking to this page, but you know, we 
actually have something that might be a little bit more helpful. Oh, and you know, we've also given you some uh, recognition on the page as well. Maybe you could take a look and, you know, then you can not only start to, to attract more links with content that you're Oh. Anyway, so those are, those are some of the tools that we use for project management right now. My favorite tool is Igniter, uh, I-G-N-I-T-U-R. It, it pulls in all of your digital marketing metrics and offers uh, task management so that every week you get a nice little report of not just what the pulse is on your holistic digital marketing across social and paid and organic, uh, but you also get a nice little breakdown of what um, what got completed the week prior for each discipline. So I could see, oh, these pages got um, optimized and, and deployed. And, oh, look, we got, you know, 20 new links from these verticals. Or, oh, check it out. We, we earned, you know, 15 new citations to this local landing page. So we can see all of that in a nice, clear report. They don't have a very mobile, responsive view or an app yet, but the platform itself is still my favorite over Basecamp or Trello or Asana or... Um, you know, what else to pulse, or I think they call it Monday. Now there's a lot of really good tools out there, but right now igniter is kind of our, our go-to. That was a lot of tools. <laughs> yeah. That's a complete list. Uh, <laughs> um, what I can, I, I really like listening to you because you, I can hear the enthusiasm and the passion for, uh, for the whole the SEO. I know I have a problem, <laughs> <laughs> but what I also wonder, um, when Google does an, one of their updates, uh-huh. is that something that you look forward to? Or is that Absolutely. something you uh, say, oh, my God, uh, this could be a nightmare or uh, panic time or, or what? Well, we think about why people come to us. They come to us because they you know, were affected most of the time. They were affected by an update or they neglected to pay attention to SEO. They did a set it and forget it, you know, a year ago and, and they've lost ranking and traffic over time. So when, when ranking uh, algorithms change, our phones blow up. We just lost a bunch of traffic. I'm in healthcare and whatever this medic thing is just took away 30 to 60% of my traffic. What do I do? So from a, from a business standpoint, um, you know, algorithm updates are great from a, um, expertise standpoint nobody can be an expert on something that they don't know about and when there's an update and they don't understand the context of it you know because they're not a google engineer um you know it it can be a little frightening to a lot of seos but you know as long as you stick to the principles as long as you stick to always making sure that that our page is absolutely the most helpful of the 10 listings that are on page one on mobile and you know that that every month we're continuing to build and improve our visibility to that page, both in our short answers and in links and people continuously um, uh, researching again for that content. Uh, And we're testing and and working on our user behavior signals and testing titles and meta descriptions. As long as you're sticking to those principle-based SEO efforts, even when an algorithm update hits, if you do drop um, over time, Google will see that, you know, that the clicks on the listings they decided to promote after that update start to go down and you'll start to come right back up. Uh, sometimes between two to six weeks is how long it'll take to sort of level out or the, the dust settle. But I, I like the updates. I feel like with every update, the, the search results get better. They get more personalized. They, they provide, you know, more, you know, rich content, except for this last one, they stripped out some of the star snippets because, you know, uh, a lot of small businesses were taking advantage of, of markup for ratings. But, um, Beyond that one, you know, star strip, uh, for the most part, the the updates are, are are always good. They're always helpful, and you know, we adapt, and that's you know, that's kind of who we are. Especially on the, the the latest update, the bird update that came out this week, you know, that must be like uh, a very good news for you. Especially since what you've explained about the long tail search, uh, yep. t- especially what uh, bird. Exp- uh, uh, is is about i think yeah um, we still have a lot of clients that just won't they won't they're so bottom line driven they won't yeah. invest in answering problems and questions they won't do how to where to they won't do that sort of thing they just want to focus on getting people to their core content and they're not willing to create supportive content or q a or anything that's that's really going to to do that so so with them because they're larger brands they're they're not as affected um, because they never had that kind of content before anyway um, you know, they're, they're hardly affected. Um, but you know, for those folks who, um, who have been, 
uh, taking our advice and, and creating uh, a girth of supportive content uh, around problems and, and questions that people have. You know, that, that nice little 25, 30% lift we saw over the last couple of weeks has been very exciting. Cool. So I could listen to you for hours, but we, we're limited <laughs> in time and, you know, we, we have to wrap it up here. Um, I have a final question for you. Sure. For our uh, listeners. I, I uh, oh, Mark, Mark wants to ask us a final question. I, I'll <laughs> skip my question for next time. <laughs> Go for it, Mark. Ask the final question. Oh, no, no. I thought we both have one. Okay. Well, last shot. You started with the voice search. Yes. And I know that in the States, uh, Alexa Home and all that kind of Google Home, that's much more the case. And in Europe, it's not that far. But usually within a year or two years, we're at the same uh, space. Um, voice search in the Netherlands is not that big yet. Mm -hmm. But what if that, uh, people get to know that much more? What for effect will that have on, on your whole SEO? Will you have to throw things, do from scratch, completely different because voice search I can understand could be much more I think if you ask a question with voice you ask a, a, a complete question a long tail question right uh, yeah a long tail question instead of that you say uh, 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 well accident lawyer no I need an accident lawyer where something like that what kind sure. of will have that will that have Well, you know, for local search, it's always been proximity first as a priority anyway, right? So it's the, the attribution part of it might be a little bit more difficult because somebody will see it, hear it and go, oh, I know where that is. And they'll just go and you won't know that um, you know, because they didn't interact with the listing. They didn't click. They didn't do anything that, that tells you that your SEO is, is getting somebody to a location. Um, so we, we have to be smarter. And, and you mentioned the, the word creative. So as, as you start optimizing for voice, you know, in, in your short answers, you might start alluding to, um, to getting the user to talk to the business. In other words, when you, when you ask your Google voice uh, to talk to a, a certain app that you've created, um, you can now customize the experience that the user has. So maybe they do a search for, um, you know, can you help me choose a lawyer? And then it says, according to, I don't know, according to lawyer experts, um, you know, the best way to, to choose a lawyer is to know the steps. Um, talk to lawyer experts on your home device to learn more. And then the user says, okay, device, I don't want to set up my Google Home over here. Uh, talk to lawyer experts. And lawyer experts says, hi, welcome to lawyer experts. Um, how can I help you today? And then now you're directly interacting with the user And now you can drive them to their mobile app. You know, would you like to see more? Would you like to um, have me text that to your phone? Would you like to have me do something where it's interactive? You know, my, my first questions that we have our clients uh, assistant app say is, can I get your first name? You know, once, once you've collected their, their first name, now you're collecting data. Now you're, you're starting to build an attribution model. But I think by teasing it with um, getting people to talk to the app, Uh, moves them from a broad voice search where they're interacting with Google to a voice search where they're interacting with your Google app that you've created through the assistant console. I think that's where you, you really um, have to start thinking about long-term is how do I, how do I get them once I get that position zero, how do I get them to do something with me? And that's where, you know, Google will say, there's some options on this page. What would you like to do? There's going to be these actions on buttons So, um, you know, as you start to read the page from your hands-free device, you'll be able to take action and do things, you know, that um, hopefully will drive them to your site so that, you know, you can do a better job of tracking. Well, a lot of exciting stuff is going to come our way. Yeah. <laughs> It was great talking to you, Steve. Um, we'll Likewise. share your details um, in the show notes so people Thank can you. reach out to you on your website and on LinkedIn. We'll make sure that it's all written down so people will know how to find you. Um, thanks again. And uh, this is typically a topic that we need to talk about in, in future again. Yes, uh, anytime. Uh, I'd, thank, I'd be happy to. Thank you guys for your time today. We're going to uh, invite you in a couple of months again. All right. Uh, podcast and then uh, next update. Uh, for the next <laughs> Google update. <laughs> yeah. okay, well, anytime. Thank you again, Steve. Thanks, okay. guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Marketing Technology Podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes and subscribe to our iTunes channel. 
Also, if you want to be interviewed on this podcast, or if you have any questions on marketing technology, send me an email on e.crum at marketingguys.nl. Thank you.